Thank you very much for coming, everyone, on, on this cloudy Sunday. One of the things I'd like to say as a way of giving respect and recognition to, to elders past and present is that all of these artists and the others who are part of the um, City of Melbourne Laneways Commission are part of a, an ongoing intervention, I use the word deliberately, intervention into um, the colonial narrative of this city and this, this state. Um, in the 19th century, people like William Barrick and Tommy McRae were making art which both articulated a Wurundjeri Kulin sense of, of being and were telling stories through their artwork which conveyed the sovereignty and authority of Wurundjeri people. And if you look at the remarkable work that these artists have produced that intervene in the story of Melbourne, they are carrying on that in a way that I think our elders would be extremely proud. The other thing I'd like to say as an opening is that, and this came up again a little yes, yesterday morning, is that when I, um, before I was expelled from the um, history um, profession, um, one of the things that the um, professional historians often said was that Aboriginal people seem hesitant to become involved in this um, history debate, um, loosely called a debate. I would say it was obviously a debacle. And there was a notion, unless you're, unless you're working in a way that is conventional, in a conventional way that um, Western intellect as a written discourse is, is conveyed that you're actually not making a statement about history, about the past. And what I knew at the time and what I've realised since from my own work and the involvement of people such as the ones we have here this morning is that Indigenous people are always intervening in the past. Indigenous people are always critiquing colonial pasts and most commonly it is done through art. It is done through fine art, through photography, through all forms of, of art practice that I would say consciously or not is in, inherently political and in, inherently sustaining for the rest of us. Um, if you've got kids, anyone who's got kids, nephews, nieces or your own kids, when I want to get my kids to understand what it is that Aboriginal practitioners do and s say and engage with the past, I often get them to watch a film maybe by Ivan Sen or to come to the Potter here and look at some art that we Barrick made over 150 years ago or to go to a performance such as the one we saw yesterday, um, the Corinderic performance. And I think it's such a, an energetic, intellectual and remarkable, remark, remarkably creative thing that people are doing. Um, now to these artists. Um, this is Laneway's Commission, which is an annual commission by the City of Melbourne that is ex exclusively Indigenous artists. The works that have been produced are varied both in the form that um, the artists have produced work in and certainly in what has been addressed through, through their work. We have some of the artists here today and what I'm going to do, it's going to be a very simple session. I'm going to ask each of the artists, starting um, with Johnny Harding, to introduce themselves and to say what they wish to say about their work, if possibly for just three or four minutes each. And then we're going to open the floor up for you to have a, 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 a discussion, a Q&A. Um, I've worked with some of these people before, some I've never met, but um, been struck by the remarkable quality of their work. Um, the only thing I was disappointed in is that um, Destiny Deacon, who is well known to everyone here, I still think the greatest piece of work she ever produced was that she called me one Sunday morning about 15 years ago. We both were living in Brunswick and her and Lisa's um, side fence had fallen down and she said, have you got a hammer and a nail? I said, no. She said, well, can you get around here and help us put the fence back up because it's blown into the street and I, I don't want to embarrass the, the neighbours. By the time I got round there, which was quite a while afterwards, it took me a while to get out of bed and shower and get dressed. The fence was back up and Destiny had repaired the fence with glad wrap. <laughs> it was like a Christo wrapping. And people came from far and wide across Brunswick to see it. And uh, I think it's, I know that it's been purchased by the National Gallery. Um, and I thought we might have seen it here this year, but we haven't. So if you want a private viewing of that, you'll, you'll have to talk to Destiny. Okay, so I'm going to start um, 
with, with Johnny and then we'll just work across if people just talk about your work and then when you've finished um, introducing your work and what you do, we'll, we'll throw it open to the floor. So thank you. I, uh, I think I'm, 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 I wouldn't call myself a filmmaker. I've only made two films, but um, when the Laneways Commission came up and it was exclusively Indigenous and I just basically thought, well, I, I don't paint, I don't draw, I don't take photos, um, so I'll, I'll see if I can make a film. Um, I already made two films before that, but I just thought, because um, I've I'm, I'm just always been a strong believer in sovereignty and a treaty, and it's like people come and they talk to me about constitution reform, and it's like, why do I want to be in your constitution? <laughs> you don't even own this country. So um, I, I just always wanted to get the, dis you know, always keep the discussion going, even at university where I work, um, RMIT, just always about sovereignty, you know, and I talk to Australians and native title and reconciliation about sovereignty, not about constitutional reform and not about any of that garbage. And um, so I, I just thought that um, I wanted to create a discussion on the streets of Melbourne, um, conversations um, on the streets of Melbourne, just with anyone in the street, you know. Um, I think we only interviewed about two couriers, so it was just anyone that was coming down the street. And we went to um, uh, like Vic Market, stood in front of the Supreme Court in um, William Street, um, stood in front of RMIT, University in Swanson Street, we stood in the shopping, shopping, uh, what is it, Hermes and Louis Vuitton in Collins Street, and we just, we just tried to get a real diversity of people, and, and what I asked them about was three, top, three sort of issues, um, identity, uh, the Northern Territory intervention, and treaty, and um, it was very, very, um, for us, it was, a, you know, um, there was one non-Indigenous person involved, and we had two interviewers one cameraman and me, and um, it was for us. It was very revealing because um, we didn't expect the answers we got, and um, you know you get a bit cynical when you're black in this country, and um, so we, you know, we sort of get, we went out with quite negative, you know, thinking, oh yeah, you know, redneck city, and and um, we actually got some really revealing and surprising answers. But the, the most interesting thing was I found I found anyway, and my cameraman, who's I should acknowledge, um, Simon Rose, who's a Murray fellow from. Uh, South Brisbane, um, was that um, the, and remember these are all walks of life, you know, there's a, a, um, Islamic people, there's a, you know, a couple that's down from um, Dubbo for the Vic Market sales, you know, we had all kinds of people. And but what was interesting was so many of them didn't trust the government to actually be responsible for the treaty and they were actually saying, why would you put that in the hands of Julia Gillard? <laughs> and they were saying, look, the treaty should be between the people. A lot of people said it should be between local government. That it, why can't the Maribyrnong, you know, the people who live in Maribyrnong um, have a treaty with the traditional owners of Maribyrnong, which I, would be the Wurundjeri, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so many people said that, and we didn't expect that. No one wanted the government to sign anything because they don't trust the government. And so that says a lot because, you know, Australians aren't that stupid. Um, and, and that was the most interesting thing that I found, but also about identity because... The, the reason I asked the, the topics in that order was to start from self, so identity. So I'd say, you know, how do you identify yourself? How do you identify an Aboriginal person? How do you identify a Torres Strait Islander? Um, and they were really interesting question, um, answers as well, because some would say, um, how do I identify myself? I'm Australian. Some would say, how do I identify myself? Uh, I'm a lawyer. How do I identify myself? Um, you know, a week of coals. So it's just really interesting, because that says a lot about how they identify us as well. And then to go on to the talk about the Northern Territory intervention was interesting too because I didn't think so many people would know much about it. And a lot of them said, oh, we think it's just about the mining. And you know, you don't think, you don't think about it like that, but they, don't, you know, they know what's going on too. They said, oh, it's just to get the blacks out of there so they can get the mining, the minerals out, you know? And that was interesting too, because they're, they're not silly. And, um, and then the last thing was, was about um, a treaty, and that was about the local government. Um, a lot of them said local government or state government, but for Christ's sake, do not give that to Julia Gillard to deal with. Um, so I'll, I'll just stop there, that's pretty much three minutes. <laughs> um, my name's Ioani Scares, I'm from the Gugutha and Nukuni people of South Australia. Um, I've been here for about four years. Um, uh, yeah, so the work um, that I created called Iron Cross is about uh, uh, the influence of Christian missions, particularly on my my family and my grandfather, who was born on Kunaba Mission on the 
uh, northwest of South Australia, just outside of Sejuna. And um, he died at 68 and chose to be buried back there. And I thought it was interesting because um, I'm not religious. I was never raised religious, but he, um, I guess as part of the displacement of Aboriginal people, he chose to go back to, I guess, the place that he was more familiar with. So um, I created uh, uh, 50, um, or the idea was to create 50 bush bananas um, encased in iron crosses. And uh, there's sets of, um, uh, five sets of 10, uh, <clears throat> I guess, duplicating 50 years of uh, his, I guess, uh, life as a Christian man. So he, um, but also to talk about the, the loss of language, how the missionaries treated Aboriginal people. There was no um, room for, you know, to uh, practice cultural traditions, their language, their way of life. And um, it's really interesting because I've been back to that country as well recently and <clears throat> people are still living on these missions and they, that's their home. And it's, for me, I'm distressed by it because they're, you know, they're not, they're not, yeah, they've been removed and they're living on these, these areas where <clears throat> there still are ongoing problems and um, they've been left there to be forgotten about pretty much. Well, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so uh, I use bush bananas in the work itself to reference um, bodies, uh, as spirit, uh, because they have shoulders, the bananas have like a stem um, and I use a lot of um, bush bananas in my work and um, so I primarily work in glass as well so it was kind of um, a really, like a challenge to, to create the work for a public setting because um, I'm so used to creating the work for myself as well so, and to create something in silicon rather than glass but um, it has been a really, yeah, interesting um, experience as well as um, being amongst all of these artists as well. So it's, um, I'm quite proud of what I've achieved with this work and yeah, so, and to be given the opportunity to do so. Anyway, uh, good morning, oh, no, good afternoon all and um, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, the, the Melbourne Laneways, it's the first time I've had a, I've, I've been in the art game for 20, 22, 23 years or something. Yeah, yeah. I should have a, a gold watch or something, but anyway, I've got, I get to travel. But, and I, um, I grew up in Melbourne, so having a laneway was really um, interesting and important to me because um, I grew up in Port Melbourne and uh, Fitzroy and Tony and, and Johnny knows, but they're a bit, just a few years younger than me, they're catching up, but um, yeah. Uh, as children, we were able to come to the city of Melbourne and just run around. Um, we'd go to the, the pictures. It wasn't so expensive then. And, and you'd, oh, if the member was on, you'd just, just run around crazy and, sh and just make sure you got home by um, day, uh, you know, before the sun came down. And so there was lots of noise and we'd, we'd play games and just chase each other and, and up and down laneways. And yeah, I don't know, there was all, all sorts of games you could play in town and stuff. So with my laneway, and it was really hard for me because a lot of the laneways in, in town, they stink and there's all these skips. You guys know that, hey? Yeah. And I, I, being the princess that I am, I, I chose the cleanest laneway <laughs> and the most grooviest, sort of narrow and, and, and hip laneway. But um, it's right next door to the Salvation Army building that's been there since the 1800s. Um, so I was very lucky. Uh, yeah, they agreed. Okay, and I said, I won't do nothing crude or vulgar, I promise you that. And which is very hard for me. So basically, I wanted to have those noises and those sounds um, that, that I heard growing up. And that's like little girls playing Skippy and stuff. And I was lucky, my friend Natalie there, that, Natalie King, um, heard, I was able to use her daughters to sing the songs, but her daughters are all innocent. They didn't know n naughty skipping songs like I did, like the lady upstairs is drinking gin and drinking gin is a very bad thing. One, two, three, and out. And <laughs> these sort of songs, the poor kids, they, I don't know, they don't, I don't know what happened to skipping songs. So 
So anyway, it's, it's going down memory lane for me, I suppose, a bit. And there's also, yeah, other sounds of the sea from like Port Melbourne. And, and Melbourne is a city that, on a bay. Yeah, it's just not very far away. Not like Brisbane, we have to go miles to go to the beach. And also there's, uh, there's pictures that I've got that have... Um, I really wanted to do stencils on the walls, but you, you have to get permission and stuff. So I've used f uh, recent photos uh, that I've taken. And so it's been like a, a personal art gallery. Um, yeah, nobody sees it. We entertain the public for free, of course. But, yeah, so there's... Yeah, and it always has to be changed because of the weather be or the rain. So I've had Virginia Fraser going on a ladder with, with the flower and the glue and the, the broom and... So, yeah, and it's been going on for about a what, couple of, few months now, yeah. So, and, yeah, so the sounds are really important. So whoever goes down that lane, they hear sort of things like, Daddy, come home, and, and things like this. And, um, <laughs> chilling, it's chilling. And, and um, <laughs> oh, I know, and it really freaked out some people, because you've got people that live nearby and stuff, or probably a deadbeat dad or something, but, you know, it was giving him the horrors. Yeah, and so you had to sort of put the sound down and do this, adjust things, but I think sound's really important. And I've got these little disco lights. Um, why not, hey, hey boys? Yeah, I don't know, you're probably innocent, <laughs> these old boys. And, um, <laughs> I thought, why not, you know? Uh, so if the sun hits the right time, but that's, well, unfortunately we, we haven't got the sun out at the right time, but um, yeah, you get all these little, little disco lights around it a bit. Uh, yeah, if you look up above the pictures and stuff. So it's basically a story about childhood and how, how the city, um, I don't know, well, children's, is it a children's place to be? It should be. And it was, I was lucky I had a, a childhood in the city and um, oh, we used to get up to mischief. We never got arrested though. Yeah. yeah. And um, well, we didn't even steal in those days. <laughs> I don't know what we did. We had no money. Anyway, life was just happy and, and fun. And yeah, that's, uh, that's my lane. And so I hope you get to hear it and, and see it. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Derek. Um, my artwork was uh, with three other people, but uh, they're not in today. But uh, yeah, it was, it's uh, called Living in Two Worlds. But what I get from it is um, the present, past and future as in the past was with all the animals and how we used to live. The present is with everyone and how it is today. And the future, I just hope everyone would, wouldn't care about what nationality you are or, you know, try not to just randomly kill any animal that doesn't need to be killed. And so, yeah, like if you look after each other, eventually the country will look after you. And, yeah, like... I reckon it's good for the indigenous that this laneway is coming up because at least our artwork and that get out there, like, be good, like, deadly, like the um, aeroplane that the indigenous did, uh, three million dollars or something, and that, there was that much paint on it that it couldn't even lift off, had needed a full tank to lift off, and that was for the Commonwealth or Olympic Games, so, yeah, that was good. <laughs> Um, yeah, but about time, I reckon, so. <laughs> yeah, that's all I can say. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, my name's Stephen Payton. I'm um, Gunai and Monero from uh, Gippsland and New South Wales. Um, and my piece is about a creature called the Dullagar and um, he's a, a hairy man sort of um, creature and he hangs around in the, the hills near the coast um, so he's from from my area um, I'm not related to him as some of my family have suggested with my beard but um, <laughs> he he's, he's a hairy man and he likes to eat fish and and uh, the story is that he, he comes and um, takes little kids that stray from the camp. So um, he's a bit of a, a protector in that way that he, he keeps kids, you know, together um, and not sort of wandering off. Um, and so my, 
my piece is about um, him coming to the city, um, and it's called Urban Dulagal, and he he comes on the premise that all the the fish has run out in Gippsland, so um, comes down in search of fish and and finds himself uh, interacting with with the Melbourne culture and and sort of fitting in. Um, so he's at the start he sort of comes down and he's he's hiding down laneways and um, then it, towards the end of um, his journey he he's eating sushi and he's having coffees and um, hanging out down into Graves Street so um, yeah the, the piece is kind of trying to trying to bring this story into a, a modern context and and you know kind of re um, reinvigorating a story to, to um, bring it across to a new audience and um, yeah, just kind of, I guess, teach a lot of other people about um, Victorian Aboriginal culture and, and stories um, that we as kids were told, um, you know, for a long time when we were growing up and around the campfire and that sort of thing, um, just, yeah, trying to trying to keep that alive. I guess showing, showing in a way um, that, you know, we are still here and the, these are our stories and, and um, this is our culture. So um, it's a bit of a bit of education in that way. Um, and it's, the piece is uh, um, a lot about cultural heritage and, and the environment as well. Uh, and I, I used bark in it as well, so the bark was a uh, material that was used a lot for canoes and um, shelter and all sorts of stuff um, for Aboriginal people um, in pre-contact sort of days, so um, I wanted to continue the use of that bark in a, in a different way, so um, yeah, you can see it's kind of hairy sort of bark that gives it that that Tuluga, um quality. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if anyone's seen the work, but um, the, the Dulaga is also just the male figure of, of those creatures. So, um, if you know about Gippsland, there's um, the Den of Nagan. The Nagan is the, the female version of the Dulaga. So, um, yeah, if, if you're ever down Gippsland Way, just ask people about it. Even New South Wales, everyone knows the stories of the Dulaga, so um, just, yeah, talk to people and if you want to find out about it. One of the things when Stephen was, was talking that, that struck me about a connection between some of the works because in, in Stephen's work he's talking about the, the both a story that sort of yeah puts a, a bit of fear into kids but it's to protect them and hold them and Destiny if you read the, the notes on Destiny's piece about when she was growing up in Melbourne when kids had a lot more freedom they were a lot, they were, they were a lot more presence on the street and kids are not seen as much now or they're under sort of very strict forms of almost control and, 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 and surveillance. And in the wonderful work that the Wurundjeri um, mob have done um, with Bunjil, if you, um, if you ever get the chance to go to Bunjil Shelter, which is in the Black Ranges in the Western District, and it's a, it's a artwork and, and spatial narrative um, story which is at least, at least 10,000 years old but probably older, one of the um, aspects of that story is not just about creating land, land boundaries and, and recognising national boundaries between different Indigenous groups. There's a particular aspect of that, of that story which is about the protection of children, looking after and, and nurturing um, Aboriginal children. And the other note with that with the 19th century, um, when people like William Barrick were coming in from Corrindirk to um, Melbourne, in the 1870s, um, they noted the, the, the lack of care for children, for children of colonials. So there's a lot of homeless kids on the street in the 1870s. There's actually a Victorian um, 
inquiry, a, a, an equivalent of a Royal Commission into the, the level of homelessness amongst um, young kids in the city. And the Wurundjeri were just shocked to see this lack of, of, of care for children. And one of the things that, for me, that resonates in the works is that sort of nurturing and, and protection. Um, Destiny talked to it, but just before we open the floor, any of your, the other artists, um, how much say did you have in, or, or were there particular lane ways that you were attracted and you thought, well, this is where I want my work, this is the site that would best suit my work, or were you given the sites to work with? Start with me. Um, yeah, yeah I've, when, when the uh, commissions came up, I, um, I actually had this idea a while ago to do this, this work, um, and I guess this was a, a, a platform that I was able to do it on. And so I, I went around the city and basically walked down every single laneway that I could find. and. Um, noted which sites I wanted to use. Um, initially, I, I wanted to do nine pieces, um, but it seemed to be too much, so it ended up, ended up being five Dulagars. And um, yeah, I, each, each piece has kind of got a, um, a small story um, attached to that particular site. So um, whether it's him, the Dulagar kind of hanging up high off, off a pole or something or um, sneaking down an alleyway, he's, he's, um, he's interacting with that, that space that's in the laneway. Um, one of the pieces in particular is um, on, on a cliff um, that used to be uh, along, uh, it's actually under all the buildings there at um, Exhibition Street and it's, I wanted to remind people that this was, you know, there was a place here where there was, the buildings weren't here, and you know, this is, this was an Aboriginal landscape, um, the cooler nations here in Melbourne, and um, yeah, I wanted to remind people that um, there was this underlying landscape there, so um, that's why I put that piece at, at that spot on that cliff, so. I had to find a laneway that was long enough to fit my work because it's nearly 14 metres long. So I'd same as Stephen, walking around and around and around until you found that place. And then it, eventually, because it's up, you, the owners have to say yes as well to the work being fitted to their walls. So at one point, um, I had two offers, like from the two different buildings in the one laneway. So, but um, yeah, we got to choose where we wanted to go, so, but it was also up to the, the owners to, to say yes to that too. So. It, it is hard yakka finding a decent laneway. Like I said, I, I picked one without a rat or a Siberian hamster and I was grateful. But, yeah. Did you pick a, did you look for a particularly clean laneway or did oh, yeah, it was... Yeah, oh, yeah, I sure didn't want them jumping on me and stuff. No, so no, yeah. no nightclubs nearby or anything? Yeah. No. The, <laughs> Well, no, the Salvation Army next door have a lot of um, regulars and stuff, so I had to be mindful not to have things that were too, yep. you know, like they turn up in the morning and I didn't want to have the sounds giving them the horrors and stuff and, you know, what have you. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's sounds of birds, there's sounds of this, there's sound, you've got to be yeah. mindful of these, of, you know, yeah. of, of the people. Yeah. And Derek? Um, well, our piece was about Melbourne yeah. and everything, so we didn't really... It didn't really matter to us where mm -hmm. it went, as long as it went up. Yeah. And yeah, I'm pretty sure it's on Collins Street. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, it's all right there, it looks good, so yeah. wouldn't change it. Good. Mm -hmm. And what are you, Johnny? Because mine was a film, it was funny because, um, I, you know, Meg, Meg Hale, who was the manager, I think the title was, of the Laneways Commission project, and um, she was, because it was a, uh, a film, we were looking at first for white walls. Um, and then we couldn't find any white walls in laneways, and then we had to find also because it was audio, same as like Destiny's thing. But we, you know, we wanted to make sure it wasn't too noisy, like traffic was. And um, and then we couldn't find any white walls, and if we did, then it was too noisy, and there was cars coming in and out because it was in front of a car park or something. And um and so then we started thinking, oh well, maybe we can just get some paint and paint the, paint the walls, <laughs> and then we thought, oh no, then we're going to get permission or whatever, and it was all too getting too hard. But also we had to worry about the fact that. I needed a projector opposite the wall 
to show the film. So which meant you had to get permission from a, you know, whether it be an insurance office or a bloody medical centre or whatever, to stick the projector in their in their in their building so I could project across the other across the lane to the other wall. So it was all just it was just um, really hard. And then um we had the uh, Meg actually had the idea of um putting it in a window. So we stopped looking at brick walls and started looking at windows and then she found Manchester Lane. So anyway, the, the lane's called Manchester Lane, but then we went to the window and it was a shop. She was going to use this shop, Meg, Meg Hale. Um, but then the, I don't think the shop owners wanted us to put our, you know, proje data projector in, like in front of the cash register, you know, like, and going out the window. And then we had to go to the car. So we went to the car park next door, which is a residence car park. So the people, all the rich people live in the city, live above the car park. So it's a private residence car park. And we got permission from the, whatever you call it, the manager. And we put the thing in there, the projector in there, and mounted it on the thing. And then um, it's a rear rear, um, what do you call it, rear window projection, mm -hmm. so you, you, everything's inside the window, the screens have been whitened, the windows have been whitened, there's um, two, and uh, by the way, the film goes for about 12 minutes, so, you know, if you're shopping in the city and you run out of money, <laughs> go and watch a film for free, it's only, it's only 12 minutes. <laughs> the, one of the other things that, I mean, it's obviously, again, it's quite um, specific to, to Destiny's work, but it's about growing up in an urban environment and Aboriginal people being made invisible, but you have this, you know, the whole life spent in the inner city. Um, I remember when I, I went for a job at the museum and I was being interviewed and um, the guy interviewing me said, do you know much about the museum? And I said, yeah, he said, had you spent much time in the museum as a kid? And I said, I used to come to the museum every weekend when I was a a boy and he got really excited and he said what to look at the exhibits I said no I said I knew it was a good place to make girls from private schools uh, and it was free I got sick of hanging out with girls from Fitzroy what we're gonna do now we've got about 10 minutes left and we're gonna get you to ask questions or make comments uh, I wanted to um, ask a question about uh, street art and community art um, I was a uh, in the 70s and 80s, I was um, community artist because it was, that's what, uh, uh, you know, if you had a social conscience, that's what you did. Um, and I photographed a lot of graffiti in the inner suburbs at that time. And then I was in touch with a lot of young people in the 90s who were doing, um, you know, graffiti on public spaces uh, without, without uh, permission and uh, I just wondered this is a great th th I mean this is a great laneway project but as you say you had to get permission it's very sophisticated um, you know would you go that step further and you know perhaps encourage young p Aboriginal people and also white kids you know to you know reclaim reclaim the space and not ask permission to put their, you know, photographs or screen prints or, you know, whatever they wanted to on walls. Are you, are you saying that, like, people should just be able to go in there and if they want to graffiti it or put photos up or show films, they should just be able to without the formality of a commission and a City of Melbourne permission? Street art is political, like it's ephemeral, but also there's protocols with street art artists, like no one tags other people's artwork, especially here in Melbourne, there's a strong element of that and there's a lot of respect for each other as artists. And coming from Adelaide where street art is seen as criminal action to come to Melbourne and have laneways, buildings, people's homes, you know, um, having artwork on there, you know, in the streets is amazing. So I think, um, you know, like the artist Rico Rennie, who's not here with us today, he's, you know, he's, um, he comes from a street art background as well. So there are, I guess, you know, you can, yeah, there, there are, Melbourne is, I feel, is open to it. I think there, there are political actions, but that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you have to ask permission because the walls are there ready for it, I think, so. But that's just my opinion. I mean, there's a couple of issues there. I mean, there is a lot of um, transgressive political art done in Melbourne and, and done by Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, obviously, and 
I think historically some of the people on this panel have been involved in it. There are two issues though relative is that there's, and um, Jean Mundine mentioned this before about, you know, whether it be not copyright but moral rights would, would include for, I think for all of these artists, uh, Aboriginal artists is that all of their work is going to be done with permission of the community anyway, the, the Aboriginal community. So it do, it's going to inherently involve protocols. And there's a second one, and I understand where the question's coming from um, and respect it, because I think there's an importance in being able to, to transgress and to not get permission, to not be involved in those formal processes. But the other thing is, and it goes back again, I think, to John Mundine's um, comment, that, yeah, it's basically about getting ripped off these uh, artists and they should be paid and paid well and they should be out there and being publicised and selling their work. So I think it's there are many ways that, that, that the, uh, these artists are operating, but recognition, part of the turf with recognition comes with what you might call institutional practices. I want to ask people to please put your hands together and thank the artists and clearly go and see the works.